I'm going to start by welcoming you all to this webinar on retaining wall design by the master series. I'm just going to take you all through a very quick, if I can find the right tab, overview of what master series is because not everybody knows what master series is. Unlike a lot of software, master series is a fully modular system. Analysis of frames, portal frames, even simple beams, with the finer element, dynamic and seismic analysis, steel, concrete, concrete slabs, composite connections and timber design. And then we have masonry and retaining wall and pile cap to augment all that. Now in fact, just for the record, pile caps is also integrated as well, so maybe that should be over there in Burgundy. But I'm not going to worry. So, I'm assuming that you can all hear me. Um, but I will keep going. So, fully modular and the help people we have two, three, four solutions. The building design suite, not what we're looking at today. Power pad, there is some retaining walls in power pad. Master port plus, there is no master port plus. Or we can just go straight and customize the suite to whatever you want. So, go to custom suite and I can just choose retaining walls and nothing else um, from the list of software. In this case, the guy is choosing masonry, but you could choose retaining walls or whatever. So very, very modular. You only buy what you need. So I'm going to close that down. Don't need that anymore. And I'm going to think about where I want to go. I want to go and start the master series. So starting up master series 2020, um, 4th of January edition, and we'll log in as both master series and power pad. So we get full flexibility in our license and start now. So checking our license on the cloud. And here we come all the different modules. Integrated frames and portals are standalone and then are simple little beam designers. In our case, just straight to rotating walls. And I can pull a file in. So, rotating walls. It's going to open up. And it's going to give us a list of files that we've looked at before. And I'm going to go straight for rotating wall examples. And open. So, here we go. There's our first retaining wall. Very simply, we do gravity retaining walls. We don't do embedded, we don't do sheet piling, we do gravity retaining walls. We can prop it and tie it, but we do not do embedded walls. It is purely gravity overturning and flexing retaining walls. So what have we got? A simple two and a half meter, two and a quarter, high wall, 200 thick, 250 base, and the first thing I'm going to see is it's Eurocode and Eurocode, surcharge and water table. So if we look at the output, surcharge 10, that's the default, and water table is at 750 up. He's playing safe. He's putting a wee bit of water table just in case there's a wee bit of blockage in the seepage holes, or maybe he doesn't want to have seepage holes and drainage. He is designing for this water. We walk across these tabs at the bottom and we can see the thickness and the length. Now, to design a wall, you set up your basic dimensions and whether you want any soil behind or in front of. And I'm going to put in 300 mil of soil. So 300 mil of soil will actually have no effect because the 300 will be cancelled out by the minimum depth of overdig. So we're going to assume a 10% overdig, that is 250. So we're going to have 50 mil of soil considered here, which is nothing um, according to the rules of both the 800 
and the euro code we need to allow for on expected excavation of either 500 mil or 10 percent whichever is a smaller value so i'm going to come along i'm going to size the wall and the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to look at my defaults and they are all euro code standards i'm happy with that 10 kilonewtons yes now let's look at the soil data we're going to go for simple base friction i'm going to have an 18 kilonewton sub soil density 0.6 standard um, submerged ratio uh, no tension cracks no cohesion and no base back soil cohesion so what we are going to work with as well uh, is a pressure of 150 is our safe working pressure on our base now you'll notice that there's the facility for two values you can to the euro code have two different values to consider in different loading cases um, I just had a message, I can't see you, Tommy. So uh, just confirm you can all see me and hear me. If you can just raise your wee hands just to confirm that I have not been talking to myself. Great, Claire. Thanks, Connor. So everybody is good. And of course, you can see me and hear me. I think I might have heard otherwise before now, if that was the case. So you can put two values in. I'm going to put in a single value. Where you're excavating and you have fill in one end and you're putting it into existing soil in the other, you can go for back and front pressure again to be different. And you can also elect to work at rest. So slightly different on the pressures. You can see here it's 30 kilonewton meter moment. If I go and at, say at rest, it's 47. So let's change those angles for us using the signs of this information. So we can see that it works. Now, we now, with our loading on and our soils right, can play with the base. So we can either have front or back or both. So if I reduce the front, that, so I'm increasing causes us to possibly overturn and we're now at a bearing pressure of one now i'm going to put in say a 500 frontage it makes sense we can afford that and then we can say instead how much we can reduce and i can only reduce the front the back to 1150 now it's not bearing pressure is the problem, but sliding. That means there's not enough weight on the soil, on the base to stop it from sliding, coefficient of friction. All of this load here is all being applied onto the base. So to make that work, we either extend the base, the simplest, or we could have taken a step back gone back to our soil data and said well mm, we should at least get at least maybe 10 kilonewtons per meter square of cohesion that's the cohesion between the base and that would make that work but if we're going to play safe take out the cohesion and we would need to make it longer make it heavier so we can either make it longer or thicken the base Obviously, thickening the base has its own problems. As you can see, it's not doing it very quickly, thickening the base, but making the base a bit longer. And I would turn around and say, right, let's make this 1300 and get us a two meter wide uh, overall length. Uh, nice, square, simple. And that's my first retaining wall done. Nothing too difficult obviously there's a wee bit of water table to look out for but a nice regular base now let's look at my next base and see what the difference is we can go 
for the traditional L, where we have done a lot of excavation, but we want to hide it from anything out here. And that's quite efficient, but does need quite a length. Now, obviously, it's not the same wall, um, just for your information. So that's the L, and it's not too much of a shake. The other type of L is the one that becomes problematic. And this has major problems with overturning because of lack of load and sliding again because of lack of load. So we've had to thicken it up and we're still getting more and more problems as we look down through it. We're still getting a sliding problem. Now sliding at 1.5 is going to be an awful lot of extra concrete to make that not slide. The only way I can make it not slide in reality is to come along to props and prop at base. Now if you're in the power pad version you will not have props but you will still have the prop at base. So there are some mechanical means to making that not slide. So let's go back to the wall data. Can we make it thinner? No, we now have a problem all over the place that we don't have enough weight to give us the pressure over enough of the base. There's only 15% of the base under pressure, so we do need that extra dead weight. And we might as well disperse it between the wall and the base. No point in having a very skinny wall with lots of reinforcement and then a, a fat, fat base. Let's spread it out between the two. So that's really your soil mechanics. You're balancing, you're looking at your wall sliding, your bearing pressure. Your, what we now need to look at is the steel. Now in this case, there will be some steel, so go to reinforcement. And you'll see that we actually got quite heavy steel. Let's put this all back up to two hundredths and back up to two hundredths. And we'll see these diagrams changing so our capacity is still quite a bit more. And we'll change that down to sorry. That's better. So we're now getting closer. And with tens at two hundred everywhere in this wall would work. Obviously, because of the weight problem, we can't really reduce this down uh, in thickness. So instead, if I was to come along and make these eights, we would see now the inner steel is failing. So back down again, back up. And we'll see that, just pressing the wrong button there, we're back to 200s, 10s at 200s. We'll make this wall work pretty straightforward to place about. And again, inner wall face and outer wall face. It will assume that the mesh or distribution steel is internal to give the maximum lever arms to your main reinforcement. And that's the sensible way to do it. We're also using 500 Bs and C3240 steel. Continuing on, these are all been plain concrete walls. I'm going to move across to my next wall, and that's a masonry wall. A plain masonry wall with no reinforcement. If I was in power pad version, I wouldn't be able to put reinforcement into the masonry wall. It's either reinforced concrete or plain masonry, and that's it. So, and I think that's probably a wee bit over the top for that. Tens at 200 all over the place. So how high can we go? Well, if we go back to our wall data, 215 wall, standard brick thickness. If we increase that height to 1300, we are now failing due to tension in the wall. However, there's a couple of tricks we can play. And one might be to add in a wee bit of projection above the wall. 
but clearly this is too much and it's, you're not going to get down there very very quick you can add some additional load but very very little we could come along and add an additional load or what we could do is we could say well this is really a garden wall and we know that we have no vehicular traffic or anything behind this so let's go back take our wall down say 100 mil up and tell it that we need it to be 1500 these are jumping in 100 mil intervals so I'm going to make this 50 delete so 1500 we are failing at the moment what I'm going to try and do is go to my defaults and tell it that in fact we had already taken the surcharge off so we're having zero surcharge zero let's try and get rid of the water table pull that down and we're going to pull that down what we do is we actually put it negative minus 500 and that just gets it right away out and we can see that this wall doesn't work the classic answer is to step it so I'm going to go to my wall data and ask for a stepped wall. Now we're going to have inner and outer. I'm going to take off the outer and I'm going to say I'm going to come down by a meter out by a hundred and then down. So I can see and um, the third value is actually not even required because it's just down out and then that's left over I could see how far down I could go can I get down to 1200 so I could have the first 300 at the slightly wider and we can see here that I was on the sweet spot there so I would probably say no a wee bit tight on the drops let's make this 500 so we'll make this a thousand of a drop and there we go and that is my wall and we could see here that we probably didn't even need a hundred but hundreds as small as you could go and we could even take it such that we actually start with a hundred wall at the top and we come down 500 out of a, a hundred semicolon down 500 and out another hundred and that would give us a more economical wall in fact we're we're putting up was up, what was up there down there and therefore we now do have a wall that works as a standard stepped wall and it is on the old three stroke five to one ratio for um, masonry walls so stepped walls not a problem coming along if we didn't want to step it we could put in two skins and that's done by going to the masonry tab and saying I want an outer leaf now initially we can have it without anything in there so it's just dead weight a cladding that's not very useful we want it filled and we're going to go for composite action but it's still not working and the reason for that and the reason I've done it this way is to show to you how you should be doing it this wall here is just cladding is form work it is of no significance so we have a wall that is only 200 wide with some reinforcement in it so what we need is to get this wall in the outside thicker so I'm going to say fill cavity outer leaf I'm going to make 215 and then inner leaf is 100 so 100 cavity 100 inner leaf and the 215 is on the outer side that then has the strength because this is your compression zone to work now we also need to play around with using 
lightweight bricks go down to 3.5, it does not work because the bricks is your compression strength. So let's get back up to 7.3s. I prefer 10.4s, but 7.3s would work. And that is your retaining wall designed. Now, there is an alternative to that, which is quicker to construct, but not necessarily cheaper. And that is to make the cavity wider. Because it's still part of the design. It's from that edge there all the way across. So we can make a wider cavity with enough ties between the two of them and then pour it up. Now obviously with this you have a weaker wall during the pouring and construction but heck you've still got a weak wall out here during pouring and construction because you'll not have put the soil back in so it's not necessarily the end of the world. You can get a 200, you can get ties to suit 200 gaps. And that's an alternative solution for you to work with. So moving forward we need to start getting into more complex things. And the third option is the most horrible option and that is piers. And I'm going to go actually and say no 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 it's concrete blocks. And suddenly with concrete blocks it's very unhappy because they're a lot less strong. Um, they don't like it and work very well anyway. So concrete blocks, we can have it with the pier, and here's our pier data on the tension or compression side. Obviously on this we need to have some sort of reinforcement down through the block which is not practical. So for masonry it is more practical to extend this compression zone uh, in the system and we could even step that if you wanted to but we'll see that the interface is in tension and is very unhappy so it's not a very desirable solution we could come along and look at the reinforcement and we could say oh somebody didn't put reinforcement in the wall that might help and we're now looking at peer reinforcement and wall horizontal reinforcement. So we need to look at the horizontal reinforcement and increase that because it's spanning horizontally and possibly reduce that. But we are getting into all realms of difficulties here in placement of this steel. And I say it's not a desirable approach anymore. The reinforced cavity is a better solution to this. And particularly without any reinforcement you're on a hiding to nothing on these. So moving forward having resigned from that and decided it would be better as a concrete wall. And we can get a higher depth, we can do a lot more with a concrete wall either in compression or in tension and we can taper them as we saw previously. If you look at the piers, you have two inputs. So the top of the pier is 200 wide, the same width as the wall. And the bottom is 500, so it's 200 and 300. And we're putting 212s down through the pier uh, to reinforce it. And we can then say, well, how far apart could we get these piers? And we could then work on optimizing the horizontal and the pier. So pier inner steel maybe go and we could put certainly put in two sixteens. So I go in the wrong direction. So there we go, two sixteens. And then so it's really two sixteens down here. It talks about the inner surface of the pier. So let's keep going, see if we can get away with wider. So 3 metres sounds reasonable to me. They were 0.5 because it was 225, just make that 3 metres. 
and we can work away with that. We can see in general we're going to be well inside and working on that. And we look at the basic reinforcement, we can see that it's well inside, spanning horizontally and working with the pressure. So shear reinforcement would also be 500B. Another solution to you, but awful construction, awful formwork involved in this. So what's our next option? Well, obviously we can go for a fat wall that tapers. There's not a problem. We can do that so that we can give us the thicker strength we need at the base, but taper it as we go up the wall. And that is very frequently done. And in this case, it's only a 10 mil taper, which is a bit nothing, or it's a 100 mil, it's a 100 mil. It's just the digits are showing up there small. I'm so, I would assume that it's 100, yeah. So 100, 250, and we could even taper the outside so it's going fat on. So it's got two tapers. Not what you want to be shuttering up all the time. So you'd probably prefer to have this and only have this one. And off you go. And that again gets us a solution to a problem. Now we've introduced two additional inf bits of information here. We have at this stage gone forward and we have in our soil data introduced two layers of back soil. So we now have the upper soil and then we have the lower soil. So in this case we're going from 30 the 35 degrees friction on the lower and we are going for different densities and we have a little 10 kilonewtons per meter square cohesion on the soil. So we can play around with our soils and at this stage we can also play around and use a different material on the front to the back and the base. So we in essence are looking at four different soil properties. Front soil, base soil, lower back and upper back are the four zones of reinforcement that you can play with. We have also added an incline to the soil. Now People have asked us how we calculate all of this, and it's just a little note for you. We do not use Rankine. We use the Coulomb wedge theory, which is a lot more efficient for complex loading on soils, on walls. And naturally you use at rest if you want to be really annoying, and everything comes a little closer to the limit, or not at rest and we're fine. Depends on your circumstances and your needs. So walking along and let's see what we come up with next. Okay we've seen the variation on the stepped wall. We actually looked at that earlier. We now get to the very complex. So what we have is a tapered wall. It's propped at the base. It's got a load on the wall plus two loads on the soil. So those loads will, will propagate through through their wedges onto the base. And that's why you get these little kicks all over the place as the pressure increases and then sort of relaxes and then increases again and relaxes and then increases with the soil depth. We also have this kick inwards because we've got a moment on the wall as well, causing us a bit of grief. So we have this walkway or something attached to the wall, pipe rack, whatever you want it to be, and it is applying a 10 kilonewtons at 700 mil out from the edge. So we've got awfully complicated loading. So let's look at our loads. Line loads, we have one, two, three, four of them, and we have stipulated down and below. We have loads one and two are a live and a dead load, which is quite interesting. I would have probably said both of these should be live, which is going to make it worse. 
and then load 3 is 100 or 10 kilonewtons on the top of the wall so I'm going to say that that is going to be a, a dead load and then you have this over here and if it doesn't know it'll use live but we're going to say a live load I can also add full and partial surcharges so as well as the basic 10 which we have in here in fact we've set our default surcharge to 12 and a half uh, from our defaults it's factored up I'm going to come back and turn around and say that my loading for partial is another 10 kilonewtons between 17 and 6.5 so from 1700 out which is about here we're also getting another set of loads so we can see how these all play out by playing with some of the data we can turn on and off loads to see how they're handling themselves and we've seen that we actually put in the 10 basic plus an additional two and a half as our blanket load so you wouldn't have that plus the surcharge i mean make up your mind it's one or the other i think in these it's not uh, not rocket science the other very nice thing we have is a horizontal search and that's quite useful where you're dealing with these where you want to make sure that there is no horizontal load at the top of the base or whatever height usually 6 8 50 up and I'm going to say it is 5 kilonewtons so it's taken that load and it's given you know, from a fence from a railing whatever and it's giving another additional overturning onto this wall because of that surcharge so a barrier of some sort I'm going to turn off we can also say well this has got an upstand and the wind catches it we could have another one kilonewton and that can have an effect uh, in this case it does but isn't always that significant but one kilonewton is in this case a pure load that's causing it to overturn and take that off so those are all manipulations of the loads applied to my structure all very very flexible and powerful so where do we go from here let's see we're into number 12 and we're into basements we're into propped construction now you can't see them because you can turn off drawing so I'm just going to set everything so it's going to draw everything because sometimes you don't want to so I've got a base prop I've got a prop here and I've got a prop here so we are dealing with a basement and we've got a bit of a distribution of load and for this width of pad we're dealing with 230 kilonewton per meter square so it's pretty highly loaded and obviously you might want a wider base to try and disperse that we also have the surge charge load and I think if you've got a vertical load, you probably shouldn't have a surge load at the same time. Otherwise, it's going to run up and hit itself. So let's take off the horizontal surcharge. And let's take off... Well, there is no upstand on that. And that's a more realistic. What we do have is this 40 kilonewton, the 4-ton load at 2.5, 2.7 out, coming down through as well, giving us this kick in our pressure diagram and then water table dragging through so we're seeing this giving us a load and a moment now the wall is 300 and the load is at 100 from the edge that means it's a stabilizing load giving us a little kick bending moment diagram back so if I was to go to that load and I set up it at minus 100, put it at minus 150, it's now concentric and does things a wee bit better. And we can play around with others and we also have another load. So we appear to have two loads. And I'm going to make that 150. And I'm going to make that, sorry, 
a live load. So we've got 140 coming down there twice and that is really stabilizing but also putting pressure on this base. So you know it's a question of whether or not you would have realistic um, uh, loading in here you know that sort of load coming down onto a shallow base is a wee bit of a question. Naturally if I increase the load here sorry the width you'll see some movement in it but it's all coming into this zone to the euro code we're dealing with a um, partial rectangular pressure diagram rather than the old Euro um, BS code trapezoidal triangular um, loading diagram but as you can see that this isn't really reducing much and of course it can't reduce much because it's all balanced and focused around this point so in this case, it's probably a questionable as to whether or not you can actually even construct this for this pretty severe set of loads. So what I'm going to do is, and that's per meter run, and that is very, very, very high. I'm going to come along and say, well, no, I'm going to say I'm going to have a wall that's 18 kilonewtons per meter one, maybe. Uh, sounds realistic to me. And I'm then going to have a second, and it's going to be the live load and I'm going to make that 25 kilonewtons per meter run that's more realistic make that a live load and then those two values together are more realistic the 40 kilonewtons four tons that's light vehicle that's reasonable uh, obviously that's single axle as well you could argue that you then had another one that was at five meters out to mimic the other axle and then you'd say that was also live but at that stage that's coming down so through at such an angle that's not really significant but totally flexible totally powerful and totally usable okay Moving forward very quickly. Does anybody know what that is? That very simply is mimicking a Gabian wall to the British standard. Uh, a wee bit of a mixed code there. I'm going to go for 8002 and BS. And there is no masonry. So I'd say it will be that, but it won't matter. What we've done is we created, we need to create a wee base, I created a base with a little overhang, and then we put these three steps in. Again, not that difficult. Thousand down, a thousand out, a thousand down, a thousand out, from an initial 1500. So this is a mass concrete blob. But it's not really. Because what we've done is we've done a little couple of little tricks. Let's get the reinforcement. We have told it that there is no steel in this upper. And we've told it the tensile strength of the concrete is zero. So therefore, if under statics it produces any tensile forces here, it would give it a warning. And since there's not, this is a Gabian wall. All you need to look at is the density of the concrete to make sure you get a right density of concrete. And off you go. There is a concrete density setting in one of these tabs as well. Which I, for the concrete density set, the 16. So it's a lot lighter weight coming down, but it's showing that it is enough to resist the overturning from the soils. So a little simple Gibeon wall using a wee bit of lateral thinking, but we are engineers. This is a 200 thick masonry wall, but it has reinforcement up through the middle of it. And if I look at the wall data, it's 200 wide. If I look at the masonry, it is 10 Newton blocks. Uh, 20 density. If I look at the reinforcement, here comes the rub. 
Somebody's put them in. And these should really be coming in at 133 centers, I believe. I think that's the standard centers. And the longitudinal can be either every or every whatever. So inner wall, 88 mil. So from this face, we're going in 88 mil to res put in our main vertical reinforcement. And then the base is just a normal. So what we have is a reinforced masonry wall. Now, that's very clever, very straightforward. I'm just going to go in and look at Master Series. I'm going to go into my client area and luckily for me I've already logged in so you don't get a glimpse at my password. There's two areas in here you want to think about. One is downloads and under downloads there are sample files. Those sample files include sample retaining walls which includes the th standard set outs for the three Steephawk retaining walls. Even if you're not using the Steephawk by Anderton, you can use that as a starter to mimic your own configuration of wall information. Or if you're just using standard hollow core filled, that's fine. You just need to watch how you control the cover. And I'll explain that in a minute. So you can download those and use those. So let's have a wee quick look at what it's all about. So let's go back one uh, to back the dashboard. Not the downloads, but the technical notes. And there's a the lovely little technical note. And in my case, I'm just going to type in Steepock. Get to it. Search. There we go. Reinf retaining walls. Reinforced hollow blocks. So let's have a look. Whoa, let's just magnify this back down one. We can see that the walls are hollow. We can also see that there's two notches in them. And those notches are important because what those notches do is they allow you to put the distribution steel in accurately and therefore tie your main steel accurately at the correct lever arms. They're also notched so that the concrete flows through horizontally as well as vertically. So you actually end up with it being very clever. So there's a lovely video here you can use. You can download from here as well. And looking at the information, if we look at a 256, we will see that they produce a whole range of different block configurations. The 256 has you know, internals, has full length externals, half length externals and quarters to allow you to manipulate the blocks correctly. So as you will see that each of the blocks has gaps in it to allow the reinforcement to come along at 133 centers repeating through the structure and it's very straightforward they also give you the mark out dimensions to work out if you take that dimension to the center plus five mil for half a distribution steel plus 16 divided by two eight you will get your 88 mil of lever arm or not even cover from this face so that's all worked out for you with the standard reinforcement and it's very very clever. Now going back to our own software I have added two of these into the system and I will show you how to add another one in a minute but in the meantime if I was to go and say create one from database my current database has, oops, sorry, not the database. The database has two walls, which is 200 and a 256. So I can say, yes, that's the one I want. Open that up. 
and I'm now sitting with my 256 wall and the reinforcement is set out at the 133 and the 6mm distribution and the 8mm main steel or the 10mm in plain steel and you can increase that if so desired and work away with the correct concrete grades and steel grades and all that ready for you to design and you can see a two and a half meter two five six wall it's a lot more than we could do on reinforced of course it is in fact we could possibly push this on up and see could we get higher and we can see that once we hit 2.7 so 2.6 is the limit on that inner steel now going back to the inner steel it is tens at the minute I'm gonna make that 16s and I really need to push that rebar down by um from tens to sixteens is so I'm gonna make it interface cover is now six mil less which is eighty six and we'll now see because the bigger the bars the more the more lever arm you get because their centroid is moving ever so slightly towards the tension surface because it's the distribution steel that does not move because of those notches and we can then come back to the wall and see how high we can push this so very tiny argument you might nip back and change your cover by one millimeter and make it work but you know that's as I've calculated and off you go 2.9 wall with a 256 steepock wall now, I will look at importing and creating your own libraries in a minute as a training um, part of this, but just showing you what all we can do if I was to come back to the design briefs, we were at the steep hop wall, the one we brought in initially. Moving forward, now we have our highways. At the minute, we can design highways to the British standards. The highway loading is all to the British standard, the BD 3087 and 3701. Uh, within the next couple of months, when we issue the 2021 version of the software, we will have the Eurocode equivalents um, coded out and available for you. So at the minute we're doing highway. So what we get on highways, once we've selected to use highways, is we get extra input. We get load factors. So this is for some sort of loading up here. And if we then come to the loads and we place a line load at whatever, we can t say rather than dead or live, we can say HA, HB or construction. So we can add those loads in under a highway p set of information. And of course, with those loadings now applied, we're ending up needing a bit more in sliding. So we can sort that out. A bit more in bearing, we need to give ourselves a bigger base and a bit more steel. So let's look at the sliding first. Very simply, let's prop it and that's not a problem. Or we can turn around and say, well, really under soil data, we're gonna go for a soil cohesion. Uh, for the base, there's the cohesion on the base of 10 kilonewtons per meter run. And that's not doing much. I'm going to say 25, if I can type. And now we don't have sliding. So 25 kilonewtons per meter square cohesion. Not friction, cohesion, and it will work. Bearing pressure, we need to 
augment a wee bit more. So the bearing pressure, we can only solve that by either increasing the allowable pressure. 100 seems a bit small for these sorts of work, so I'm going to say 150. That does get rid of that problem in this case. Um, actually, we might even reduce that. And now what we've got is wall steel and base steel. So let's look at our wall steel. And we go to reinforcement, and we can see these are failing at 200. So let's make them 20s. That's OK. The base steel is 20s again for flexural requirements because that's quite long. The longer you make these, the more you have to sort the base steel. So the longer this is, the more flexural lever arms you have. And therefore, um, the more it goes into this one than this one. Obviously, keeping them both the same reduces the moment because it's more balanced on each side as you go. So there you go. That is a for want of it, garden wall adjacent to a um, highway or a large wall, three metres is a pretty high wall. But we can also go for the more complex walls. Um, that is not the one I wanted. There we go. That's what I wanted. This time, we don't just have highway loading. We actually have bridge abutment loading. And we can see where the loading comes and what it is. And again, for the bridge abutment, we have a whole multitude of different categories for our loading. As I iterated earlier, this is all for the BS standard at the moment. Somebody's asking, are the Steepock blo blocks mortared together? And that's a very good question. And the beautiful answer is no. There is no mortar. They are, for want of a better word, dry fitted. They um, sit with no mortar joints whatsoever. And if you watch that little video, hopefully it's still there. Oh. They've now made it private. That's rather unfair of them. I'll have to get a link to that update on our website. But um, they sit together, giving you a beautiful, fair-faced finish. Because it's like a honeycomb. It's like a potato waffle um, of in-situ concrete going vertically and horizontally with rebar vertically and horizontally that's tying it all together and making it work and giving it cover. Um, so the wall external is not part of the real cover. So that's a very simple answer to that one just by where we're there. So bridge abutments and then finally what's left? Absolutely nothing. It's just that steep hock wall that I introduced. So how do we get steep hock walls introduced? We have gone to our website, we've downloaded the sample files. What I do is I come out of here. And I load one of the sample files. There are three sample files and the one I haven't introduced yet is the 325. So I just load the 325. Make sure everything's correct in it. Yep, it's slightly different spacing of rebar, 162 apart and 69 of lever arm and mesh. And now that I'm happy with that, and maybe let's see how tall we can go. So we know that at four meters is the limit on these. Four meter for a three um, two five wall with nothing else, just but a reinforcement. That's pretty good. And in this case, no water. So I want to get this into my database. So I want to take this wall and I want to add it to my database. So that has now gone into the database. And if I go and I say add brief from database, 
we will now see that we have three walls. We have the 200, the 256 and our new 325. And as soon as I close that, I come back out with another wall. But that's how simple it is. So uh, I'm going to just do one last thing. And that is going back to my walls. Take all of this one stage thir further for your reinforced masonry walls and for the other basic reinforcement. We can take this and we can export it. We can export it as a DWG or a DXF. Or we can even export it into our old RC detailing software. But I'm going to stay with the DWD DXF. And we're going to ask the wall. I'm going to have U-bars and straights. I want another U-bar at the top of the wall. The base is going to be U-bars and straights as well. So U-bar and straight. Now it's two meters long. You could argue that you would might get away with something a bit simpler. So we could go for two asymmetrical U-bars. That would be interesting. Or we could go for top and bottom U bars, sticking up, sticking down. Or an open link and straight. I think an open link and a straight is a very good solution for the base. The length of wall that we're going to detail is going to be 5 meters. So every 5 meters we're going to have an expansion joint or a gap or whatever. And the horizontal offset and the vertical offset for bars could be 100 mil. And the minimum bar gaps, for, oh, you don't want this wrong, I'm going to make this minimum bar gap 600. So, and the wall kicker is 250, so we're going to start with our kicker up here, 250, and that will dictate the length of the U-bar to get a lap, plus the kicker, plus the slab below. Going to put it out at 1 to 20 default, and I'm going to export this drawing. Going to export as a DWG and load AutoCAD, and this is where I'm going to store it, and out she goes. Okay, there's a wee bit of a quandary in one or two of the bars, which I could examine. Uh, my slab is only 250 deep, so therefore it's getting a wee bit humpy about that U-bar return on the wall. So I probably have stopped, should have stopped it and gone for a different arrangement of bars. And likewise on these top here, you know, if it's only 200, you can see that you're ending up with tightness of the bars. So there is your detailed reinforcement not certain what I was moving there so let's just take we zoom in and go move and take this bar might want to move from there down so you can now see the separation of the two styles of bar, the, U, the open link plus the closer, and you can see also these coming through as well, and everything. So you have your starter bars, and that's all a good starter on your detailing, on your five meter long bars. So that is all straightforward into AutoCAD or DXF for other CAD systems. You can also produce a schedule to match that, and of course it's still getting a wee bit of annoyance on these bars because the leg length of 130 is not available and the leg length of 156 is not available because of covers. So we would really need to deepen it and there's the schedule coming out. So in reality we would need to make this a lot wider to facilitate or change the detailing method to facilitate
the thicknesses of walls that we're accommodating. So let's have a quick look through all the questions before we let you all go. It is one or two o'clock and I thank you all for coming along. Can you explain what at rest and virtual back are? Well, at rest, the soil has moved slightly and therefore is pushing down onto it. It is um, covered very much in the soil mechanics um, publications, but basically highways people like you to design to at rest, which means it's moved and loaded onto the wall, whereas most other people say, no, no, we've packed this all up as we go. Nibs, oh, we never covered nibs. Nibs are a little bit of a problem. So Eurocode, Eurocode. Let's go back to the wall data. And let's add in a 300 wide nib. Well, no, let's make it 200 wide. And I'm going to add it in up ah, here. And now I'm going to say that the nib is 250 deep. Okay, we've got a 250 wall. And now, because of the nib, the wall's failing. What's that about? Well, unfortunately, that's really to do with the way the code, the 8002 and the Eurocode says, this pressure here continues, the pressure you have here continues to increase here and increase here. You know, as you have a bigger wedge coming down. So at this point, you still have high pressure. Whereas the, so the pressure on this side is only slowly starting to gain. Now, if I asked it under drawing to auto select, you'd see that you have this increase of pressure all the way down to 25 down here. And you have this increase in pressure from 11 to 22. So obviously the passive pressure is increasing faster as it does as you push up against something. Whereas the active pressure started from a very high point and is growing slowly, but had a very high, high point starting point. So their argument is that, you know, certainly putting a nib back here, you're pushing more here than you are here. If I was to go to the wall and make the nib over here, the codes make no difference for it. It still says you've got the full active on to the same onto the surface and the full passive. But in reality, what's going to happen is as the wall prop the soil propagates through this. This is going to come out neutral, balanced, and, or even zero. Because let's face it, if you took that out, you're not going to get soil bubbling up. So there has to be some. But that's not part of the type of analysis that we do. You would need to do a very, very, very fancy yield line analysis with flow nets and all that sort of stuff. Or I suppose it's really a computational fluid dynamics type solution for soils that you would need to do to make a take account of and get strength from nibs. So nibs have gone out of fashion because of that silly rule. Maybe they should argue that the distance from left to right is, you know, 100%, 50%, zero from the active and then only over here passive. So passive only, active and passive. 50-50. You know, I don't know. That's a very good PhD. How much allowable tensile stress in a, a masonry wall? Well, that depends on your code of practice. That's that's the fundamental of designing any masonry wall in Fletcher. And that is based now, we're not dealing with a masonry wall here. That is based on your statics and all your calculations, you know, you're looking down here at your wall 
and that is giving you your compressive strength and your tension strength. Your flexural strength is coming in at 0 0.75. It's tiny, but it's enough. Is there ability to analyze masonry walls for blocks laid on flat? Blocks laid on flat would really be all to do with your masonry, your least horizontal dimension, your unit height. You play around with those to get blocks laid on flat. Graham's asking about propping during fill. Yes, you do. You need to fill that walls, cavity walls, steep hot walls. You need to fill them quite slowly to prevent bursting. Now, the steep hot guys, because it's one homogeneous wall, they have their own rules as to what height you can pour in one go. But yes, you're needing to use something that you can pour without bursting the wall, without causing any hydrostatic um, splitting of the wall. So that's why I was questioning this thin wall being realistic. But you know, you obviously you might have some soil back in this at the same time. But yes, you normally would like to prop both sides and pour in sections. Can you manage to optimize the designing with different soil parameters and layers? Yes, you can. You, as you saw earlier, we can have two layers uh, of soil. Um, they can even be a sloping layer as well. Uh, is it good to design a masonry wall for tension? Well, in retaining walls, you can't get away from there being tension because you have an overturning moment that is more than the, st than the stabilizing gravity. That's why you need such a big width when you're dealing with gabions. So for ordinary masonry, of course you've got tension. Um, it's a case of designing for it uh, using the rules. Uh, somebody's asking, uh, Jace, can you, can you on the gibbon wall option pitch the face? I assume what you mean, you can certainly move it so that it's stepped on the outside rather than inside. Obviously that gives you less um, self-weight but does have other benefits. Uh, Steep Hawk is very expensive. Can you demonstrate a standard 200 wall? Well, Steve, Steep Hawk is not really anything. Um, sorry, to hear. Steep Hawk is just a set of dimensions. If I was to come down here and go to one of our, our 200 Steep Hawk wall. So my eyes aren't seeing it. There's the 250. There's the 200. Okay, let's forget about the word Steep Hawk. Let's just say a hollow filled masonry wall. First of all, you're going to need to bed, you know, mortar and everything. Secondly, you're going to need to watch out with, for your uh, longitudinal steel isn't too thick, 6 mil bars. So t 200 mil thick filled wall. All you're looking at is turning around and choosing a strength of concrete grade Sorry, the masonry. Choose your masonry blocks. Now the interesting thing is under Eurocode there is no such thing as hollow blocks because the hollow blocks just have their a weaker strength. Um, so what you're going to go for is blocks and what is the strength of the block not the hollowness. So you don't modify your blocks for hollowness. You keep them at their full strength say 10 newtons. Now all you're doing is you're saying, right, this is a 200. So the interface is going to be whatever the 50 mil for the outer edge of the wall, plus say another 50. So you're going to put in your inner wall cover at 100 mil. So it's going to be sitting there at 100 mil. And then you're going to say walls. The reinforcement, if it is a standard wall, it's really going to be at something like 225 centers because of the pitch of the walls, the pitch of the hollows, or it's going to be 112 centers and likewise for that. So there's nothing different from that. The Steep Hawk is not doing anything mysterious. It is designing your hollow block as concrete. 
it's using not the concrete grade but the grade of the block in that criteria. You could argue that you just go for a reinforced concrete wall but set the, st the concrete grade down to 10 and keep going. But you know, there are one or two other in idiosyncrasies you need to just watch out for. But again, it's not a problem. And uh, yes, it should be a 215 wall, not a 200. You don't get 200 in the land of non-proprietary walls. So 215 and again, you have to watch your pore and everything, but you don't have the same t horizontal tying as well. Are the steep up block walls mortared? No, they're not. It is lovely, clean surface. Does it include local hollow block suppliers? Uh, Gareth, you don't need to, as I've just said to here, because it's it's just a ca case of changing the parameters to suit the pitch and diameter and cover that you're able to achieve. Does the program show the failure line of soil above the retaining wall? Base, no. What it shows you is the capacity line of the wall. And this. So what we could do is if we came along to this wall and we suddenly reduce this from 10s to 8s, we would see that we could only do that height. We would lose the last. 150 mil it would actually break so we couldn't do 200 so what you would do instead then is to say well if that's all I can use I need to come down nineteen is getting there eighteen and we're in so a wee bit of reverse engineering there can sliding be prevented by passive pressure uh, Tim absolutely eventually Obviously, with that, you have a problem. You need to get quite a deep base um, or quite a high infill here to develop that passive resistance. So, ladies, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you all for coming along. It's been a most enjoyable session. And coming back out, if you want to try the software, please come along. Go to products first. Go into retaining walls. And then select start your free trial. And that will go through and configure your trial so that you're only asking for retaining walls. Unless, of course, you want to try other things. We have in here also sample output available for you to see and look at. A whole 22 pages of, of boring walls. We also have a list of design features and design codes. And... I think there's also, there's not a, a DXF export of the graphics, but certainly that download of sample files will have some information and drawings on that of the walls that you can carry out and work with. So please feel free to try the software. Give me a call, give Andras a call, any of the tech support guys a call if you're an existing user. I would just like to thank you all for attending. And stay safe and stay healthy and let's get through all this together. Take care. All the best.